Dear all, welcome to the Stats Test Splits. What we're going to do is have this quick half an hour session. I'll share it with you all so you'll be able to watch it at any point over the Easter holidays. I couldn't use the other ones as we had people in them. And bearing in mind that we will have research methods in your final assessment in the summer term, please make sure that you understand it, that you send me any questions and that you know how to use these tests. So first and foremost, once we have conducted any kind of research, be it an experiment, a correlation, an observation, a questionnaire survey, we end up with a whole lot of data and we need to do something with that data. So there are two things we can do with it. Firstly, we can describe the data and to describe it, we use descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics refer to things like measures of central tendency. So we're looking at averages, we look at mean, we look at median, we look at mode. And they show us what the average for each condition is and give us an idea of whether our hypothesis looks like it's turning out the way we want it to turn out. Second thing we can do is we can use graphs to illustrate our data, to show what our data looks like. Obviously, different graphs for different purposes. So if we have nominal data, we'll use a bar graph. If we have continuous data, we'll use a frequency polygon or a histogram. If we have correlational data, that one's easy because we know that we'll use a scattergram. Another way of describing our stats are to use measures of dispersion. In terms of measures of dispersion, it relates to the mean because we want to see how far away or how near our spread of data is to the mean. So we can use range there. Remember the weakness of range is that it only takes into account two scores, the highest and the lowest. If we want a more powerful measure of dispersion, we'll use standard deviation. That's all well and good, and it might look like our data is showing us what we want it to, but if we don't have statistical significance, then we have nothing. So now we need to have a look at not descriptive stats anymore, but inferential stats. So the big question is, is it statistically significant? And how do we know? Well, we know because we are going to conduct inferential tests. So inferential tests refer to all those statistical tests that we have done. So inferential statistics. And we know that there are three really important things before we can choose any kind of a test. We need to know the three Ds. First D is it a test of difference? Might not be a test of difference because what we might be looking at is a correlation. So there, it's a test of a relationship. Oops, run out of a bit of space there for my bracket. So is it a test of difference or is it a test of a relationship? Next, our second D refers to what kind of data we have. Really important because as we saw here, you use different measures of central tendency for different kinds of data, different measures of dispersion for different kinds of data as well. So looking at our data, we go back to 
our old acronym, which is that of NOIR. And we know that N stands for nominal data, which is data that is in categories or in frequencies. Oops, that must have created a bit of a wobble. We know that ordinal data is data that we can order, data that we can rank. We know that interval data is data that gives us public measurement. We have a safe scale. And obviously, that's our most powerful form of data. So nominal data refers to data in categories, which we count up in frequencies. Ordinal data, we can rank it. You might get a bit of ranking to do in any question on research methods. Interval ratio data we know has the safe scale, the public measurement like centimetres, kilograms and so on. Final D refers to what is our design. So in terms of designs we know that there are basically two really. We can have independent groups design, so no one does the same condition, you're only in one condition, or we can have repeated measures where you're on both conditions or matched pairs. And the thing about matched pairs is that's really the same as repeated measures because we match people on variables, on variables that are relevant, that are appropriate for whatever the investigation that we are conducting is. Going to swap boards now, so just give me a couple of seconds to get this in the right place. I think that's probably about right. Maybe down a bit. <coughs> That's the dog barking in the background. Obviously the postman is a bit late this morning, perhaps. So once we know whether we have a test of difference or relationship, what kind of data we have and what design has been used, we can go about the job of choosing the appropriate inferential test. Now, as you know, there are two kinds of inferential tests. We have the ones that pack the punch. So our parametric tests. And then our not so powerful, which are the non-parametric tests. Oops, just get rid of that. Now, non-parametric are the ones that we're all really familiar with, so it shouldn't come as any surprise to you that, that the, those are the ones that we're going to start with. So if we consider nominal data, I don't know why I'm having a problem with my N's and M's today. So nominal data, we know that we have two possible tests that we could use. The first is the sign test where we are looking for the value of S. The second would be chi-squared where we are looking for the value of chi-squared. Remember it's spelt C-H-I but always pronounced chi. In terms of that, nominal data has been used. Sign test, these are both tests of differences. Remember when we use chi-squared, we talk about it also being a test of association. So difference or association. Don't let that confuse you because the textbook is a bit confusing in that regard because it links relationships with association. Relationships are not association. Relationships refer to correlations. The second thing that we know is when we use sign, we always have a repeated measures design. 
Whereas when we use chi-squared, it's because an independent group's design has been used. So, so much for those. Remember, sine is the one that you might be asked to calculate. And it's really easy because it's just pluses and minuses looking for the value of s because our calculated value of s, the one that we have observed is the one that we are going to compare to our tabled value which we refer to as our critical value to see whether we have statistical significance. As our data gets a bit powerful our tests change and if we have ordinal data, what we now know is that we have a number of tests that we can use here. The first one is that old chestnut, the man, Whitney, you, and remember you is the value we're looking for, and you is telling us that it's you and me. So yes, it's a test of difference where data is ordinal, but independent groups design is used. If we don't use independent groups design, then we need to use Wilcoxon T. And as far as Wilcoxon T goes, sorry, just moving, This is what we use when we are once again looking at a test of difference. So an experiment is there a difference between how we perform in a psychology quiz if we are in a noisy room rather than in a quiet room. Test of difference between those two scores. But this time, repeated measures design or matched pairs. Remember up here as well, that could be matched pairs. So on with that, if it's not a test of difference, if it's a test of a relationship, we are clearly going to use Spearman's row, which you're familiar with, especially if you do geography or particularly biology. And here, no longer a test of difference. So we have two co-variables, which are varying in some kind of way. So if the one goes up, maybe the other goes up. If the one goes down, maybe the other goes up and so on. We know that it's ordinal data, but that we may have an unrelated design or it could be a related design. squeaky pen. If we have a look at these powerful parametric tests then, they want nothing to do with nominal data because nominal data is just not powerful enough. For them, we have to go to the all-important interval data. So over here for parametric, we have not ordinal but interval data. So data that has public measurement i.e. a safe scale. And the thing about these parametric tests is that they connect with their non-parametric counterpart. So first and foremost, what connects with Man Whitney U and what connects with that is our unrelated t-test. So our unrelated t-test Let's make just a little squiggle down here to show 
that these are separate. I didn't leave myself much space for the parametric tests. So unrelated t-test here. Exactly the same as man with new test of difference. Independent groups design. But most importantly, we have interval data. And here we're looking for small t, Wilcox, and we were looking for big t, looking for rho there. Now, small t. If we, on the other hand, have repeated measures or matched pairs, then we know that we can't use man whitney u we can't use unrelated t. What we need now is we need to use related t. And obviously that's because repeated measures or matched pairs is a related design. So related t, exactly the same as unrelated t. It's a test of difference, matched pairs or repeated measures. Final one that we could use and make sure that you understand that these are paired in essence. Related T with Wilcoxon. And finally, look how similar these letters are. Pearson's R could almost be an anagram of Spearman's row which we know is similar to Spearman's row, but we're just using interval data. It is a test of difference. Oh, what am I talking about? It is not a test of difference. Okay, strike that from the record. It's a test of a relationship between two co-variables. And once again, it might be a unrelated or related design. Seriously running out of space now. The thing about parametric tests is they have to have this most powerful data and there's another condition that comes with them. And if you just know these two conditions, that's enough. They need to come from a sample population that has a normal distribution curve. So your target population needs to have a normal distribution curve. So your sample is drawn from that normal distribution curve population. So if we think about IQ, IQ, for example, has a normal distribution curve. The reason it has a normal distribution curve is because mean, median and mode are all in exactly the same place. If they weren't, you would have a skewed distribution where it would either fall over to that side or fall over to that side, i.e. a positive skew or a negative skew. So just reminding you about the other condition for parametric tests, our sample population needs to come from a target population that has a normal distribution curve. Okay, so those are the only two conditions you would ever really need to use. The fact that the variance needs to be the same if you are using independent groups. You can't have girls and boys with a difference in variance here, even though it might still be a normal distribution curve. The variance needs to be the same between the two groups. You don't need to worry about that because that's just overcomplicating it. As long as you know, parametric need interval data. So never psychology quiz test scores or a score of IQ 
or a score on a phobia scale, those are still scores. And we're not sure about variance, whether variance is exactly the same in them. So we can't use them. We have to use non-parametric for any sort of score. It's only if it has a public measurement that we can use parametric. So now we know the test we're going to use. The next bit, and I know you know this, this is the one thing that somehow everybody remembers. So we know psychologists use P is smaller than or equal to 0 0.05, which is a 5% level of significance. What that means is that we can be 95% sure that our findings are real, valid, that the difference we are seeing is true, real, valid, as is the relationship if we are looking at a correlation. And 5% only is given to chance. So there's only a 5% possibility that our findings are due to chance. Problem with this is that this is a compromise, but it's a compromise that psychologists are once again happy to accept because they don't want a too stringent level of significance. They don't want a too lenient level because that might cause false positives or false negatives. So if we think about 0 0.1 over there, we know that that's 1% and we know that that is a far more stringent level of significance. If we make it really easy for ourselves, we might go the other way and we might go to 0 0.10. So now we're saying 10% possibility that our findings are due to chance, which is too lenient. So we compromise and we say we're happy with 5% because that seems fair when you are conducting research that is dealing with human behaviour. We aren't kettles of water boiling at the same degrees Celsius each and every time. So more stringent level, more lenient level, but we are happy with that because it's a compromise unless, and again, I know you all know this little bit, unless it's a drug trial or one-off research. So if you were conducting research into the coronavirus, it's probably going to be one-off research because we will never have conditions like this again. Even if we have another pandemic, the conditions will be different. So if it's one-off research, you want to go for that more stringent level. The issue with using a more stringent level is that you could quite easily make what we call a type 2 error because we've used this very stringent level. And a type 2 error is a false negative. So what that means is that you are accepting your hypothesis well, actually, you're not accepting your hypothesis. You are rejecting your experimental hypothesis, even though the findings are real and valid because you've used this more stringent level. To make sure that you're not making a type 2 error, you need to go back to 5%. And if your findings are valid at 5%, then you can say there is a possibility that a type 2 error was made, because the findings are significant at 5%, we will therefore accept our experimental hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis. So over here, on the other hand, if you're too lenient, you're going to make a type 1 error, which is a false positive. 
because you are going to say, right, job done, that's excellent, my findings are significant, and so I will reject the null hypothesis and accept the experimental hypothesis. Once again, you need to come back to here and see whether they are significant at five. If they are, then you can dismiss the fact that you may have made a type one error because they are significant at that compromise probability. Finally, the last two things that we know we have to know is whether our hypothesis is directional or non-directional. So is it directional or non-directional? Do you have a word that gives you a direction? Or is it just there will be a difference? Because that tells us, and all of this information from here is about looking at our table and knowing how to read our table to see if the value that we have found is either greater than or less than the table value, depending on the test, so we can see whether it is significant or not. So that tells us whether we use a 1 or a 2 tailed test. So we are in the right column of the table and we can say as a consequence of all of that information that we have statistical significance, that our, our findings are statistical, st our findings are statistically significant at p is smaller than or equal to 0 0.05 for a two-tailed test where the value of u is smaller than the table value of u, thus we can accept our experimental hypothesis. Just pushing it up a little bit so you can see that last bit I wrote about directional and non-directional hypothesis, whether we use a one-tail or two-tail test. And I'll take photos of these now just to ensure that you can go back to those, you can listen to me again if you want that delight and ensure that you understand how we go about selecting a statistical test. Have fun.